It is now my pleasure to introduce the moderator for the next session and the program, uh, the program chair for this outstanding uh, Tamist uh, conference, Dr. Bonnie Dunbar. She is a professor at Texas A&M University in aerospace engineering. Um, she has been in space five times as an astronaut on the Challenger, the Columbia, the Atlantis, and the Endeavor, and she was also in the, the Mir space station through the Atlantis. She's a principal investigator for the Texas A&M Unique Laboratory for Research and Development in Space-Related Human Systems in Extreme Environments. And she's also director of the TEES Established Institute to conduct research directed to engineering education and increasing both the enrollment and retention of undergraduate students, engineers at Texas A&M. So welcome, Dr. Dunbar. Uh, well, thank you again, uh, Mr. Abbey, for your remarks and comments. And uh, I know if you visit the Baker Institute of Public Policy uh, on the Rice at uh, their website, you can see some of the papers that he's written. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Kate Rubens to you. Uh, I first heard her talk about sequencing DNA. Actually, I saw her talking, I think, remotely to the president from the station, <laughs> and then saw her talk on sequencing DNA recently at our Association of Space Explorers meeting in Toulouse, and uh, was so impressed I asked her to come uh, here. Uh, and for that talk, by the way, which is an international body, she was awarded the Best Speakers Award, which in our uh, community is called the Perchatka, that's Russian for spacesuit glove. So you get kind of a molded spacesuit glove that's made by the, the Russian cosmonauts. Uh, Kate, like many of our astronauts, uh, has a, 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 had careers. We all had careers before we came to the astronaut office. I think the average age when I was selected, it was around uh, maybe 33 or something like that, 35, uh, with uh, either test pilot uh, careers or academic careers, research careers, and Kate Rubens is no exception to that. Uh, she was selected in 2009, and she completed her first expedition, 4849, this last year. She spent 115 days in space. Uh, but she holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Molecular Biology from the University of California and a PhD in Cancer Biology from Stanford University Medical School Biochemistry Department and the Microbiology and Immunology Department. Uh, she worked as a fellow and a principal investigator at the Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research and headed 14 researchers studying viral diseases that primarily affect Central and West Africa. Uh, she. Uh, has been several awards and honors. Uh, she was named in Popular Science's Brilliant 10 in 2009. She was a National Science Foundation pre-doctoral fellow in 2000 and had a Stanford Graduate Fellowship, the Gabriellen Fellowship. Uh, she was also named as the University of California San Diego's Emerging Leader, Leader of the Year in 1998. So it's with great pleasure that I uh, bring uh, Dr. Kate Rubens to the stage. Good afternoon, hope you guys enjoyed lunch. I wanted to tell you uh, just a little short story, a small slice of life on Space Station. Um, as you know, we heard a, a lot about Space Station experiments yesterday. And uh, as an astronaut living in long duration, you're working on uh, usually over 200 experiments on any given mission, uh, along with uh, all of the rest of the duties to, to care for and to maintain Space Station. And I'm going to talk about just one of those experiments to give you a little bit of a flavor of the kind of research we can do up there and some of the really interesting things that are going on right now in low Earth orbit. So uh, the International Space Station is an incredible place to live and work. Um, it is nothing like you've ever seen in a terrestrial lab. So we all have our, our standard picture of a lab and lab benches. And uh, when you put things down on lab benches, they usually stay where they are, they don't float away, uh, and, we ha and we have our ways of working. Uh, and in 2016, uh, I found myself uh, in uh, low Earth orbit uh, and in this beautiful, incredible research laboratory. And so uh, this, is, uh, this is an amazing place, but it makes it a little bit difficult and a little bit different to do lab work in here when you're inside these modules. 
uh, everything is floating. Uh, you, you, don't, you don't expect things to behave uh, the way they do. And so the purpose of this experiment was actually um, just a little bit of a let's fly this and see if this works. We wanted to uh, send a sequencer to space and see if we could even do this uh, the first time. And so, uh, as you can imagine, I was, I was really excited about this experiment. It, it correlates with my background. We did a lot of sequencing uh, at Whitehead to look at, at smallpox and Ebola. And so I knew, this, I knew this experiment was coming up. I'd been working with the researchers for a while. And I have to tell you, I was incredibly nervous about the first time I was gonna do this experiment. I, I, was, I, was, I was actually really stressed. You know, the, the, the launch wasn't that stressful. Uh, the EVAs weren't that stressful. I was really worried about pipetting into the microcell here. So uh, I practiced a lot. I got the syringe out a few days before. I had a, uh, a microcell that I carried around in my pocket and, and uh, uh, just a used one that I could put water into. Uh, I spent a whole bunch of time injecting water into this to make sure it was perfect uh, and, and getting ready for this experiment. The day before, I set up the workstation. Uh, and so this is, uh, you can see, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the Surface Pro. This is the sequencer right here. So it's about half the size of your cell phone. It's very small. Um, I had, you know, there's some pipettes here, a camera, a few other things. I think a post-it note that told my crewmates, uh, I'm setting up my lab bench here. You better all stay away. I'm gonna float down to the module that you're in and uh, you're gonna be in really big trouble if you disturb any of this. Or it was phrased nicely, but it was something to that effect. Uh, and, and got all ready for getting this experiment done. And uh, then the day of, I went back and I looked at this whole setup and realized, you know, I gotta, I have to, it's not in the picture, but I have to go install a handrail down here. Because when you're pipetting in space, uh, you learn this really quickly in, in the first few days of your increment. Uh, you, get, you get up there, you get a laptop, you get ready to type your email, you start typing your email, and you end up on the ceiling in the opposite corner of the module. Um, so you have to learn how to hook your feet under a handrail and then really use your shin muscles to counteract any force uh, that you're working with. And so I knew, you know, we're going to be uh, adding the sample to the reaction, putting this in the sequencer. There's going to be some force attached to this, and I don't want to wind up in the opposite corner just as I'm trying to do the sequencing reaction. So I got the handrail already, uh, got everything already. And then the, the morning of the, the sequencing experiment, uh, opened up the sheeter and started working on this and uh, came back and decided, you know, I'm gonna get the pair of, uh, of loops that I have here and I'm gonna take a look at, at the reaction through these loops. I really wanna see this in detail. So I'm gonna go get some magnification. And then I looked at it again. I said, you know, I, I, I really wanna make sure this is well lit when I do this. So I'm gonna go get a headlamp. I got a headlamp. And then I looked at it, I said, you know, this is spot illumination, but what if I need some general illumination here? So I went and I got a work light, and, then, and you could see the entire workbench illuminated by the work light. At this point, you're on video the whole time, and the, the PI team's sitting on the ground, and they're looking at me coming back and forth, adding a new piece of gear every time. And I think they were just a little bit ready to get going with the experiment. So we were all, uh, we were all set up, and uh, I got a chance to uh, actually start the experiment and you, you put the sample in and then there's about this 10 minute period where you're waiting. The quality control score goes through, it checks every nanopore. You don't have sequence data and you don't know if the chip is good. You don't know if the, if the reactions work. Uh, we didn't know if this thing was even gonna survive launch loads. Uh, and, and so it's a 10 minute wait. And this was, um, this was actually, yeah, I, I couldn't even watch the, the sequencer at this point. I had to go into the other module uh, and in space you can, you can kick your legs really fast and generate force and, and flip around if you kick your legs fast enough to, in the middle of the module. So I started just doing my sort of kind of nervous kicking and floating around for about 10 minutes while I was waiting for everything to quality check and the data to start coming in. Uh, and, and I'll give you the, the summary of the story. It, it worked. <laughs> it worked the first time. Uh, it's, you know, it's a beautiful thing when experiments work. And uh, the next time, I was, I was a little bit less nervous. There was just that, um, you know, don't screw this up. You've got, you've got one or two chances to get this experiment right. It's not like something on Earth where uh, experiment's going south. You just put some bleach in the cells and then go on and clean out the incubator and do it again. There's a few other times during the increment that were really uh, these kind of giant don't screw it up moments. That's when you're out in vacuum and, and doing those sorts of things, launch and landing. 
Um, but I, I felt really connected to this experiment and I was extremely interested in what was going on here because I think it tells us something incredibly interesting about uh, what's going on with life on the space station uh, and that's everything from microbes to humans. And, and one of the reasons that we were both so intrigued about this and, and also a little bit worried that it wasn't gonna work is because water behaves so incredibly differently in space. Um, we know that fluids behave differently in space. Uh, we have a lot of uh, expertise uh, in terms of, of how fluids work in space and how they behave in space, but we haven't necessarily always adapted our laboratory-based technology to be working with fluids in space. So for example, um, things like uh, you know, how water forms uh, and, and uh, whether or not it's attached to anything. Uh, what happens with bubbles inside any fluid in space? Uh, it, 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 biological, most biological uh, pieces of equipment are not well set up to handle bubbles. And the problem is with bubbles in space, uh, you, don't, it, that you can't just assume that, that air is going to go to the top and the liquid is going to go to the bottom of the tube. So if you've got a, an Eppendorf tube or a plate or anything like that, you don't get this uh, air-water separation. And so bubbles form, and uh, then if you shake it at all, the bubbles form smaller and smaller and smaller and more numerous bubbles. And, and it can be sort of a nightmare to uh, all experimental equipment. And so we didn't know what was going to happen with the bubbles. We didn't know what was going to happen with the flow cell. We didn't know what was going to happen with the actual sequencer. Uh, this is a whole series of projects that was essentially taking commercial technology on the ground and launching it with almost no modification. So we did, we did very little testing. It's just this rapid prototyping, getting experiments up to the space station so we can answer questions really quickly. Um, but part of the excitement and the terror is that you don't actually know if this thing's going to work and they've sent one or two samples with it and that's all you've got and then you have to wait until the next launch vehicle. So one of the reasons that we're so interested in why you would put a sequencer on board is because this is such a fascinating laboratory uh, where you can actually start to manipulate gravity and understand what's happening with, with physiological systems in gravity. So we've studied uh, human beings in space for quite some time, uh, but what we have on the, with the ISS now is a completely built research laboratory. This is, this is the US lab, but this is one lab of a huge football-sized space station. And you can see every single wall of the lab is covered with equipment. It's, it's covered with racks. Uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing to actually do some experimental work hanging upside down from the ceiling. It's wonderful. Uh, you can't do this in labs at home. It, it's just a delightful way to spend your day. Uh, but, but you can see how much uh, there is up there. The other thing that we have now is really an increase in crew time. So we have six crew members on board. Uh, we have crews that are, that are up there for four months, six months, one year. And uh, we've really gotten our operations, we're in, a, we're in a mature part of this program, so we've got the operations down smoothly where crews can really handle these huge numbers of experiments and we can do things for a really long duration. The, uh, we talked a little bit uh, yesterday about some of the effects on the cardiovascular system, but the effects of spaceflight on the human body are, are really incredible. It's almost every system. Uh, I think uh, we talked about uh, neurovestibular a little bit, and uh, certainly the cardiovascular response. Uh, we've got a lot of impacts to bone. We've now been able to mitigate that a fair amount. We've got pretty good countermeasures through resistive exercise. Uh, we have muscle atrophy. Again, we can start to counteract that, um, but we're now seeing, starting to see a difference between uh, we can preserve large amounts of muscle, but we're having trouble keeping uh, real small, like for example, spinal and core muscles intact after long duration spaceflight. Uh, we have noticed their effects on the immune system. Um, this is, I think this is pretty interesting and uh, we're, we have studied this in terms of being able to take immune samples and then send them back down to earth uh, and look at them in real time, uh, near real time after landing. But we're always looking at immune cells that have been in some kind of temperate environment outside the body for 24, 48, 72 hours before we're actually able to look at them. So one of the really interesting things that we can start doing now that we have sequencing available to us on board is looking at uh, immune transcriptome readouts in actual real time. So take the, take the immune cells out of the body, uh, process them and look at them uh, almost immediately and not wait for this lag period for the cells to be live returned to the earth. Uh, we, can, uh, we have a, a pronounced uh, 
set of areas that we probably really are, are going to be focusing on much more as we think about exploration. What, how are we going to preserve nutrition for a long time on board? Uh, how are humans going to handle uh, when the earth starts to disappear from your field of view? So now we, uh, when we're in low earth orbit, the, the planet fills your field of view. You see your home all the time. It's beautiful. It's blue. It's green. It's always there. It's right outside the window. Uh, as, that, as that home planet starts to get further and further and further away, how is that going to affect us as a crew? And, and how are crews going to survive confinement in a much smaller vehicle for a much longer transit time? Uh, and then also, uh, you know, we're really starting to look at radiation effects outside of low Earth orbit. So those are all kinds of, uh, you can imagine a, a sequencing study for almost every single one of those human physiological parameters. Uh, the other thing that I was incredibly interested in is this microbiome environment of our space station. So uh, we have a really interesting uh, semi-closed loop environment here. It, you know, station is huge. It's, it's built of a, a lot of different materials. You are living in the lab space. You have regular injections of, uh, you know, these, these uh, sort of very microbially rich uh, additions to your space station. Uh, and then we, we change out crews of three. So you have a period of a few months to study three individuals in isolation, and then you add three more, and then those change, and then you add three more. So we've got some uh, ways to generate diversity here, um, and we also uh, have some really interesting things to look at in terms of how the microbiome is reacting to this mostly closed-loop environment. So we recycle 80, 85 percent of our water. Um, you know, we, we, we make uh, oxygen. Uh, we scrub our CO2, and so what's going on in that type of closed-loop system with the microbiome I think is a fascinating question, and this, is, this was one of the, the very primary drivers for the sequencing experiment. Uh, so the proof of principle experiment was just, let's take several different genomes. Let's take lambda phage, uh, E. coli, and then a representative mammalian genome, and that way we've got a range of GC contents. Uh, we'll prep the libraries on the ground. We'll combine these all. Uh, we'll send us the syringe and we'll uh, take a look at the flow cells and see how they're actually working on board the space station. Um, the, the equipment is, is small. This is uh, the type of sequencer that's really good for remote areas. It's, it's um, not an incredibly new technology. Nanopore sequencing has been around for quite some time, but really the, the kind of pocket size commercially available sequencers are fairly recent. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the way to design hardware for space. If you can pack it up and put it in a backpack and bring it out to the middle of Congo. Uh, those are the kinds of things that work very, very well for space station in terms of uh, being low mass, fairly robust, uh, not needing a whole lot of, of power draw. And uh, the, the uh, principle is essentially that there's a, a nanopore and there's a, there's a motor protein sitting in the nanopore and it will drag the DNA strands through and then sense the current difference across that pore. And so uh, this is a little bit different than the, the kinds of fluorescent tag sequencing that, that we use in the, the large sequencing machines, but it's fantastic for spaceflight applications because you don't have to deal with uh, fluorescence. You don't need to deal with a, a large machine. You don't, you're not looking for a CCD camera. There's no lasers to align. Uh, so it's really a much more robust application that's good for a remote environment. And so we, uh, you know, we did the first experiment. I got a little less nervous and was wearing less headgear for the next uh, several, and we ended up sending nine samples. We were able to uh, do a variety of things with these samples and actually do, uh, you know, some interesting, because the first few worked so well, we were able to do some interesting flow cell reuse experiments and extending uh, the amount of sequencing time. Uh, so we got uh, some very good accuracy for our 2D reads. Uh, and then uh, the, the, this is uh, looking at both strands, and then also good, uh, pretty good accuracy for the 1D reads as well. And this is the flight data here. Uh, the ground data was very similar as well. It was very comparable. It showed slightly lower read accuracy, um, but I think we have to do a little bit more to try to understand why the flight data was showing just a little bit better read accuracy than the ground data. You might expect that to be the other way around. So we took these, these same uh, mixtures of, of lambda and E. coli and, and mouse and actually split that same library. Uh, so we were sequencing identical libraries on board and on the ground. Uh, and then uh, from the onboard data, uh, we were able to uh, pull out, we were able to, to differentiate each one of these uh, different genomes that we put in here. Uh, we were able to uh, map back to the genomes 
uh, with, with very high fidelity, and we were even able to uh, reassemble uh, the E. coli genome de novo. So uh, this, is, this is the first time that we've done sequencing uh, and assembly de novo of a genome uh, on orbit. So the next, you know, this is, we're pushing towards the microbial sampling here because, you know, I've got a swab, I've got an interesting microbe and I want to know what that is, or I want to define the genomic population uh, of everything that I've got in a particular sample on board. And so after I left, Peggy Whitson went up there and there's a fantastic student program called Genes in Space. And these guys are high school students and they, um, uh, they, they design a project and they send their project uh, and they launch it, they work with, with uh, grad student postdoc mentors and they launch their project and we said this is, a perfect, uh, this is a perfect way to test out some of the sequencing applications that we want to do. So can we take a bacterial sample, we'll grab a culture, uh, we will sequence it on, but we'll prep, the, we'll prep the libraries on board. So the first time around we didn't prep the libraries on board. This time we just took raw clinical sample, prep the libraries on board, do the analysis, send the sample back and then uh, do our standard methods and see if we can uh, you see if we're even in the, in the right ballpark of what we're doing for species identification. So Peggy did this and uh, it actually, again, was incredibly successful, identified all of the species. And so I think this is a technology that's really starting to be uh, ready for prime time and, and for use on board space station. This is something that we're going to look at in the long term for clinical and environmental monitoring. Right now, the way we do our monitoring is to take uh, swabs or take sequences, uh, take uh, samples and we wrap them up and, you know, you grow them on a plate, wrap them up in capped on tape, give them your Soyuz commander who kind of fits them under the seat. Uh, the Soyuz undocks from the space station, it lands in Kazakhstan. The Russian SAR forces pull you out and then at some point go get the, go get the culture plates, ship those back to JSC, and then we start doing clinical microbiology at JSC. And so the idea that we're now starting to move some of this to be a little bit more earth independent. How much of this analysis can we do just from taking a sample on board and get all the way through pathogen identification on board? And if you can uh, do things like pathogen identification, then you can of course apply the same technology to looking at human physiologic changes. So the kinds of things that we can look at uh, in the future in this laboratory um, are, are all of the resident organisms in the laboratory. So this is, this is all of the uh, the microbiome, the biological species that are populating the entire space station. Uh, we have rodent research up there. Uh, we can you can use this technology to look at, at various things in rodent research, and then human physiology. And it's fascinating to think about doing this kind of thing completely self-contained in this laboratory that's, that's totally separate from Earth. And as we get farther and farther and farther away, we're going to need to learn how to become less dependent on this logistics and supply chain back to Earth and how we're actually going to do completely independent experiments uh, within our spacecraft volume as we're, as we're leaving the planet. So I'd like to thank, uh, obviously, the huge team that was involved in this and um, really from JSC, uh, Sarah, Kristen, Sarah Stahl and Aaron Burton uh, were the main drivers behind all of this and were an incredible team and really a joy to work with and I am happy to take any questions. Do we have any questions? Thank you, that was very nice. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering, have, are there experiments ongoing thinking about epigenetic changes? Because one could imagine with long-term space flight, the, the exposure to radiation, if there were actually epigenetic changes that were induced for whatever reason related to microgravity, that could enhance the risk of cancer long term, for example, or even short term. Yeah, absolutely. And they first started looking at that actually with the twin study when they were looking at Scott and Mark Kelly. So um, that's an end of one, but they have started to do the first uh, epigenetic changes and analysis. And that would be not a challenging experiment to do on board. I think you could do uh, CHIP fairly easily uh, and, and actually do that start to finish on board. What you really want to do is, is probably be looking at a nice densely populated time course of changes. And so uh, what, we're, what we've been looking at right now is a few time points, pre-flight, post-flight with, with Scott and Mark and, and a few time points in between. Um, but what, you, what you'd like to have a nicely mapped, 
sort of analysis of epigenetic changes, it's also an interesting to look at first time flyers who have never been exposed to that radiation environment versus uh, repeat flyers and veteran flyers. It's all, yeah, absolutely fascinating and, and is on the high priority list, I think, of things to do. Maybe you sort of already answered my question, but I'm still trying to get a better feel for the box as well. And um, having done this and succeeded, is this the sort of thing you could box up? And uh, related question, if, if we start to have more commercial use of these space stations, um, would you envision a lot more of this work to be done? Or did you find that it's not uh, incrementally that different from what you learned by just doing it on, on, uh, the, on the shore, you know, here? <laughs> yeah, so in terms of uh, boxing up, you're talking about like making this a, a portable kind of self-contained yeah, these the the boxes that they talked about yesterday. Yeah, so yeah. We're, there, there's a lot of work that's looking at uh, some of the sample prep and taking away some of the manual pipetting steps so it doesn't take as much crew time. So can you, you just go from the clinical sample and feed that in? There's probably going to be a couple steps of sample processing, you know, ligating your adapters, creating your library, uh, and then through to the sequencing. The other piece of it is how independent do you want to get in terms of data analysis? So uh, when you're looking at one of the things I didn't get a chance to talk about is um, we were looking at rapid pathogen identification, so this was in collaboration with Charles Chu at UCSF. Uh, we actually said, you know, if we really need to know what something, what a bug actually is, let's get the sequence data down from space station and see how quickly can we make an identification. And so they were able to do this in a matter of hours. Um, now that then requires uh, a data link and, and a fair amount of transmission bandwidth. Um, it's just as easy to, to fly up a, a laptop or something on, on board and uh, do at least a quick, uh, you know, quick round of data analysis on board to get something. So uh, that's also the next step of things that we're working on. I'm just kind of imagining there's going to be all sorts of things going on in the future, and uh, this is just getting us started. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, can you tell me what happens to astronaut feces and if that's a resource that could be leveraged? That, that is a great question. Um, I will tell you, I, I, I decided to do the proof of, I mean, microbiome, it's fascinating. I decided to do the proof of principle experiment because we have, you know, it takes a lot to collect samples and people say, oh, this is, this is going to be a really challenging experiment to do. And uh, David Relman was my, was my thesis advisor and I called him up. I said, you know, how, like, what's the frequency of sample collection? He said, good microbiome study, you know, weekly and, and can you do daily? And I said, all right, well, let me give this a whirl. So for three months. Uh, I tried it, and it's absolutely doable. I think we could, you know, we have to have somebody volunteer for this study. But what we really want to look at is, is pre-flight, what's your baseline? What happens uh, on board? You've got diet changes, you've got uh, phys huge physiologic changes, um, you've got influ influences of radiation, you've got fluid shifts, uh, and then what happens post-flight again? Uh, and to do a really nicely controlled study, we probably need to get in, get that same person to go eat the space food diet for another six months. Uh, to get that arm, and I'm, I'm not sure how popular I would be in the astronaut office if I suggested that, but it's, you know, space food is great. I would, I would absolutely sign up for that. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Rubens.